Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, for those of you here, here in the chamber and those watching remotely on TV or on your computers, we're glad to have you. Uh, we appreciate you being interested enough in our local government to, uh, to follow us and give us your attention. Uh, for those of you here, if you'd like an agenda to follow along tonight, they're on the table to the, the right of the exit doors. And for those at home, you can access an agenda through AthensClarkCounty.com. If you have a cell phone or a mobile device of some kind here with you tonight, please turn them off or to silent. The Mayor and Commission will have a special call session immediately following our agenda meeting to enter into an executive session of an attorney-client conference and, per on, and personnel matters. Ms. Bratton, will you call the roll for our special session? Jefferson? Here. Sam? Here. Link? Right? Present. Bailey? Present. Neesmith? Present. Bale? Here. Herod? Present. Gertz? Here. And Hamby? Here. Thank you to have a motion to enter executive session. Madam Mayor, I move for us to move to executive session at the close of our agenda setting. Thank I you. Second that. Have a motion and second on favor. Aye. Aye. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second that too. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We will now proceed to our agenda setting meeting. No final action is taken on items that are discussed tonight. These items will move to our August 2nd meeting for final consideration. There will be two opportunities for citizen input tonight. The first, the proposed consent agenda, which are items 1 through 10, and then items 11 uh, through 15, which are under new business. We don't take public comments on, item, on our uh, staff reports from, and recommendations from our planning commission. Those are items 16 through 18. There will be a public hearing for those items. Um, at our August 2nd business meeting, prior to August 2nd business meeting. Rules of a commission allow each speaker three minutes. There's a light on Ms. Spratlin's desk that will turn yellow at two and a half minutes, so please have your comments finished before your uh, three-minute limit is up. Uh, items on the consent agenda have been reviewed by the agenda team, uh, which consists of um, a management, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, our charter officers, and the mayor, and, uh, and they're recommended for approval at the May 3rd meeting. The mayor and any commission and or any commissioner may take remove an item for discussion. If, if anyone in the audience would like to discuss one of the items on our, our, our consent agenda, this is the time to come to the podium. Please give us your name and address, which item you're, you're referencing, and remember our three-minute rule. Anybody want to speak through, for items um, 1 through 10? Seeing none, we'll come behind the rails. Any commissioner would like to remove anything from consent agenda? Madam Mayor. Yes, ma'am. I think Allison, you may be first. Oh, yeah, and I don't have a problem with one, but I did want to talk about it a little bit and then put it back on. Okay. Item five. Sharon, item five. Just a second. Do you want to keep it for dis on on discussion agenda, or you just want a quick answer to something? No, I'd like to move it discussion. Okay. Please. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Yes, Mr. I'd like to move my item eight to, to discussion, and I do want to. Also, ask a question about item one as well. We'll see where okay. that goes. Mr. Hamby. Uh, number two and number six, please. We might as well not have consent. I know it. I was about to say Commissioner Sims, but also says all this stuff on consent, and then he looks at us, gives us a dirty look when he's, we take him off. He's a bad <laughs> What can I say? What can I say? Okay, we'll, we'll have item two, six, and eight at the beginning of our uh, new business uh, for discussion. But, uh, Ms. Wright, you said you just had a question you wanted to answer on item well, one. Well, yeah, well, I basically wanted to compliment the creative problem solving that has come through with this to allow, uh, once the street being closed, for the participants of the event to be able to flow uh, through more areas of the event. And I was just hoping that when the special event um, topic gets to committee that they could also be looking at how we can have other ways to have increased flow of patrons in a closed street environment for a special event and maybe look at that to see what other ways we can do it. So I, I compliment the process and the support of it. Thank you. And somebody else wanted to, was it Denise Smith? Yes, ma'am. No? Um, in the language of the proposed ordinance, I'm, I'm wondering why it's, it's paragraph B, item 3, it says the area of exemption shall be no wider than 20 feet co-located with an existing marked crosswalk mm -hmm. and kept free of mm -hmm. obstructions. It goes on to say that, the, that, that it shall be enclosed on both sides by fence, barricade, or other similar structure. I'm wondering why, if we're closing the street, Foundry Street, why do we have a limitation of crossing that street to 20 feet? 
Would you like to respond to that, Mr. Williams? Yes, and, and Commissioner Wright, I appreciate your um, commenting on the creativity of that. And I do want to credit David Fluck with that. He went and met with Paul Kramer and they worked that out. What we want to be very careful here is uh, not to create a precedent that would extend to all events. If you can imagine, if we did an entire street, then there, there would be a precedent for that with Twilight and Athfest, and you might say, well, why would that be a problem? It would be very difficult for our police to patrol that, and that's exactly why we have beer gardens. So we felt like, let's try this 20-foot crossing, and let's try to direct folks to do that to facilitate it back and forth without creating a precedent for total street alcohol co consumption. Okay? We can move back back to consent if you okay, well, we'll, the way. Okay, so we'll move. Um, well, item one was yeah, still on consent. Anybody else? Yes, I, I just want to make sure that I think I heard you say two, six, and eight should go to new business, but two, five, six, and eight should go to new business. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. And five was yours, Ms. Dickerson. Huh? Was five yes, the one you requested? <clears throat> Okay, this, this is the time that any of our visitors here tonight would that would like to speak to our new business items, uh, which are 11, 11, 12, and 11 through 15, would come to the podium to address us. And two and six. And eight. And five. <laughs> well, they've already had that opportunity oh, and passed oh, it oh, up. Okay, you're right. Yes. <laughs> Unless you want to make, open it back up. No, again. <laughs> Mr. Denson. Uh, Mr. Hamby's confusing me here. All right, uh, Tim Denson, 290 Midway Road, uh, with Athens for everyone. I just want to speak to item number 11, uh, Athens Transit Youth Ridership Program. Athens for everyone is in full support of this, uh, and we want to commend everyone who had something to do with putting it together. Um, I know Commissioner Sims and uh, the Athens Community Partnership for Youth Development. Uh, we want to commend them for being able to recognize that the transit department and the transit service can be more than just being a service that moves a person from A to B. Uh, there's a lot that you can do with this, and they've used it as a tool to try to, you know, make sure the youth of this community are, are reaching their full uh, full possibility. And uh, it's been a huge success so, so far. So far, from what I read, is that we've seen an increase of almost eight times um, the ridership here, and that is just amazing and uh, makes me really happy. And uh, I would be remiss not to point out, though, that we could see some of these same benefits across the entire community uh, if we pursued a completely fair free transit system. Um, so it's something I would like us to always keep in mind. But again, uh, I, I urge you all to support this, pass this, put this on the consent agenda. This is a fantastic idea. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Hi, my name is Michael Smith, 149 Bryan Street in Athens. Uh, speaking in uh, total support of uh, extending the fare free service to our county's youth uh, past the summertime and across the year. Also, uh, I know that the county is looking for ways to uh, make this permanent funding and I believe this is a, a great time. I think the mayor and the uh, commissioners and the county managers are all on the same page trying to do uh, great things for transit in our community. So I'm also uh, hopeful that over time we can find permanent funding for it. Uh, if I had my choice, I would take the funding as, as the proposal is, which is uh, for youth up to the age of 17. I do want to point out that a lot of seniors, juniors and seniors, uh, are turning 18 and they're still in public school. Uh, I think I think it's uh, it, I know it's a little difficult. It's going to cost a little bit more money, or we're going to lose a little bit more fare box revenue. But if we can look at ex changing that from 17 years of age to 18 years of age, that would be a good discussion and. Also, I would like to point out that if we did that, we would need to think about uh, if we were going to ID them or not, or just allow 18-year-olds to, to, to be on the bus with the public school ID or a regular identification, because another benefit for this would be for the freshmen at Athens Tech 
to be able to ride for free. And I don't know why Athens Tech doesn't have a fair fee program for its students, but I think this might be a way to meet them halfway. We'll take care of the kids 18 and under if you take care of the students 19 and over. So, uh, but again, I want, I'm very happy about the uh, idea to, to extend the program to youth 17 years old. I would like uh, permanent funding looked, for, looked at and also uh, adding one more year, 18 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Hi, I'm Chris Stoud. I live at uh, 245 North Harris Street. Um, I'm also speaking to item number 11. Um, so, as you know, I've been an advocate of fare free transportation for a while, so I just can't pass up this opportunity. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to thank you for considering uh, extending this program year round, which lets kids ages 5 to 17 ride the bus for free. Uh, since kids need the Athens Transit bus sometimes to get to school, um, it only makes sense to help them get there, and I'm sure the Clark County School District, as well as the kids and their families, will appreciate it. Um, so I'm in, in complete support. Um, I urge its passage. Uh, however, it should be noted that uh, fare box recovery will decline by an estimated $40,000 if this is adopted, and that makes our already inefficient uh, fare box system even less so. Most of our transit funding right now comes from UGA, the general fund, and the federal government, and not from fares. Um, I don't personally don't, don't consider the UGA contribution to be a fare exactly. Um, so by my calculation, the percent of total Athens Transit funding that comes from the fare box and from ticket purchases is about 13.5%. Um, and extending this program will lower that to about 12.8% or so. And uh, I'm not bringing this up to discourage people from voting yes, <laughs> uh, but rather just to point out that the vast majority of funding comes from other sources. Um, so my, my point is that fare boxes are not really necessary for us to have a bus in athens Clark County. Um, the next point I want to raise is that fare boxes cost money to buy and to operate. Uh, more than people usually think. Um, just to collect fares, we spend somewhere between one hundred and one hundred fifty thousand dollars every year if you average out the cost of the boxes over their expected lifespan. Um, since a lot of the money actually changes hands at the multimodal uh, station's teller's window anyway, purchasing these expensive and fragile boxes makes even less sense. Um, they cost money, they slow boarding times, uh, and worst of all, they discourage ridership. Um, so. As Tim just pointed out, there was an 800% increase in youth ridership this summer once kids got to ride free, which is amazing. Um, normally, in places that have tried fare free, it's more like 30 to 50%, which is still really good. Um, so what happens when you increase mobility and give people a little bit of extra money in their pockets? Well, our local economy will probably improve, um, which gives us some, some of that money back in sales tax revenue. Um, and although uh, the transit revenue will decrease, uh, since the total cost of the system uh, also decreases and the ridership increases, um, the cost per rider will plummet, I mean, especially if it's 600, 600%, but it'll still decrease anyway. Um, so the way I look at it, I mean, the, the if you care about cost per rider as your metric, this fare free is really something to think about. Um, so an investment in public transportation, especially in a community with a high poverty rate like ours has, it's an excellent investment. So thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Dow. Anyone else wish to speak to, um, to our items on our new business, 11 through 15? Seeing none, we'll come back behind the rail. And item two was the first item that was taken off of our consent agenda. Mr. Hamby, I believe that was yours. Yes, ma'am. I'd just like to keep it off consent just so I can make sure some of the neighbors around there know, know, know about it and know, know what to expect. Thank you. Okay. No discussion? No, ma'am. Okay. Item number six. That would be five. me, too. Oh, five. Five. I'm sorry. I'm out of order because I, I'm trying to get away from you, Sharon. I'm not sure I want us to discuss that one. Alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah, that's a tough one. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Um, Dickerson. So um, I guess my first question is I just want to make sure I understood. The manager's officer re responded to a question I had. Um, on page 23 of the PDF, item C, refers to uh, the DO, uh, Department of Revenue's policy or pr their procedure process. Um, states that any any um, municipality county that issues licenses or to a licensee authorizing manufacture, distribution, or sale 
of alcohol, alcoholic beverages shall by resolution or um, ordinance adopt a policy. So I want to make sure I understood. I'd asked a question if this, if this referred to our breweries at all, and I kind of gathered that it didn't. Um, and I don't, I guess I want to understand a little bit better if that could be explained. I think does it or does it not? I think that's Mr. Behrman question. Um, it does not. And the reason uh, is because of the way that the Department of Revenue has defined licensee. Michael's law was broader and potentially could have captured breweries, but this um, guidance document that came out from DOR on July 1st specifically defines a licensee to be a bar, which is an establishment, a retail sales establishment that has 75% or more of its sales from alcohol. So as the, a brewery becomes more retail-like with the changes in laws, will that change or not? Well, I think it would take a significant change in the law. I mean, right now, a brewery is a manufacturer and not a retailer. There's this narrow exception for brewery tours, but they're still not selling. Okay. They can charge for a tour, but they don't sell the alcohol. Okay. The um, I've got two more questions. Um, uh, the next question is, isn't there a loophole essentially though for businesses? Let's say I owned a bar downtown and I decided I was going to have a live act, somebody either air guitar or actually playing or singing, and I charged admission. Wouldn't that be a way for me to get around this? Well, they would not be. Um, I mean, that's correct. That's uh, some. Well, all that means is that people under 21 will be permitted to come in. If right. there's I mean, a live part of this. musical or dramatic performance where an admission fee is charged, then people under 21 can be admitted. Okay. Um, the final thing has to do more with process. I mean, we're obviously setting in protections for people who um, might be um, visiting an establishment. What, what about the establishment themselves? What about the business? What protection are we setting in to keep people from just coming up with frivolous or unsubstantiated claims that somebody that they've been discriminated against how is that going to be addressed i'm sorry i'm not sure I understand. well i mean obviously this is a this so there's penalties for businesses if they discriminate but what is is there a penalty for somebody who falsifies that something's happened to them you know what i mean is there some way to make sure that when they're coming forward with it that they've substantiated it and they're not just dragging somebody through the mud or you know basically making a big deal about something that doesn't didn't happen I guess is my point. I mean, just a protection against the business. I mean, any one of us could be, somebody could come up to you and say you called them a name or, you know, drag you to court. I, 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 you know, this is a process that's set up. So I'm just looking for, is there a protection for the business at all in this process or do they just have to, you know, I, and I understand, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying there's, there wouldn't be substantiated claims, but I just want to make, I guess I'm just asking, is there any protection for businesses from well, people just calling and saying that they've got a problem? Local governments are required to report cases that the local government makes. So I don't believe that a local government is going to make a case against an establishment <clears throat> that's based on a frivolous or unfounded uh, statement. And generally they would get a person complaining, say a person says, I was 19, but I was admitted to this, this mm -hmm. bar, and I'm complaining about that, and they were lying. You know, I, I would think that either our office or the police department would get a written statement, okay. and it's a crime to make an, an, an untrue written statement as a part of a government investigation. Okay. All right. I just, I'm, I just want to make sure there was some prize trying to understand the process. Yeah, I think the issue that you're dealing with is we are probably be dealing with in our uh, Government Operations Committee for our discrimination. Ordinance. Right. No, I know, and that, and it's sort of there's, but no, I understand it's about yeah, age, so, but yeah. I just want to make sure I understood how it was going to work, how somebody would bring forward a, an issue like that. Mm -hmm. So, so they actually would come to the county, fill out a form, affidavit, whatever, sign it, and then y'all would proceed, and the rest of the other issues would come through GOC to back to us, would be part of this or not, or is that completely separate? Well, it's it's a, it's a separate issue. That, okay. As I understand it, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, I'm trying to put it in lay language that we understand. This relates to cases that we have brought and we report them to the state, what, what we've done as a government. And, and what, we're, what we're going to be looking at in our um, government operations committee is, is a, a mechanism for, a potential mechanism for maybe uh, citizens to make complaints. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I wanted to, to make a point. Uh, Sharon's first question about uh, whether breweries, which are manufacturers, would be required 
to report infractions to the state. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, uh, but there's nothing stopping us from doing that. We could make a policy that we report all infractions to the state. Currently, we do that anyway. That what they, they're asking us to do is kind of the bare minimum, and it does allow an exception for a manufacturer. But if we wanted to make it our policy to report all infractions involving alcohol licensees, including manufacturers, I believe we could do that. Is that correct, Phil? That's correct. The police department has pretty much been doing that for the past few years for all, both civil uh, and criminal violations related to alcohol licensing. Anybody else want to come in on this item? Okay, just, we'll move uh, on to Mr. Here. Oh, I was sorry, just going to just yeah. comment. So th the context of this is obviously a change in the state law, and the state law was changed because there was a case where a bouncer killed a patron in a bar. So that's where this is coming from. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on to item number six. Not in this community, I hasten yeah. to add. We're going back on consent with that. Do you, you want to leave it off or keep it on, leave it on consent? It can go back to consent. So. Back to consent, okay. Mr. Hamby, item number six. Yes, ma'am, thank you. And I'm going to leave this off consent just because I think it's worth miss mentioning twice mm -hmm. that, uh, that we're getting rid of the pay and display meters. <laughs> And uh, I'll say it again in two weeks, just so everybody knows. And I'll say whoopee. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Uh, so we'll leave that off consent, Jane. Uh, and uh, number eight, did anybody else want to comment on item number six before we move on? Okay, item number eight, eight which is Barnett Shoals Sanitary Sewer Interceptor Project. And that was Mr. Neesmith. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about um, under facts and issues, and I forwarded this question to Blaine earlier today. Perhaps he's had a chance to see it. Item number eight, which says that uh, so, uh, individual easements are required to accommodate project construction. It's talking about the sewer. A PD representative will negotiate with each of the seven property owners to secure both the sanitary sewer easements and easements for the greenway. And in number nine, it says, uh, pertaining to condemnation is not applicable to the acquisition of any permanent or temporary easements needed for the Greenway. So I'm wondering why we have chosen to allow with this ordinance uh, condemnation for sewer right-of-way, but are explicitly taking away that ability for Greenway project. This is purely a policy issue, and it's my understanding that uh, traditionally uh, the unified government has not condemned other than for roads or, or public utilities purposes, although I know there was a case where uh, park property was condemned and, and the uh, owner successfully sued, and hence I think the reticence for going outside of that. Now certainly if that's um, an authority that you want to give us, we can do that, but I would suggest that we, uh, you allow staff to negotiate on good terms with the owners and hopefully be successful. If not, we can return to you and ask for that. Well, I would, I would assume that we, we would negotiate with the owners uh, before we went to the, to the um, extent of condemnation, and even then they're going to get a fair market price for their property. So I just hate to see us uh, not take care of both the sewer um, easement requirements and the greenway, which are the same, are the same piece of land, uh, while we wouldn't want to do that at the same time. They're not exactly the same land. The land that we're con going to acquire for public utilities are temporary construction easements because we're replacing the line in place. We already own the permanent easement. Uh, we own nothing of the, uh, the greenway, so we'll be getting permanent easement, construction easement, and there's also some recreational easements that we'd like to acquire as well. I see. Uh, it will not hold up the project for us to, to proceed as, as recommended because, of course, the sewer project needs to be constructed first, and that's going to take some time, so we have some time as well. So you're saying it won't hold up the project because after we get the sewer project going and we've done all the negotiations and get the sewer project going, we'll have time before we need to acquire the rights of way for the Greenway? If, if we have an unwilling property owner and if it's the will of the Commission to condemn for those purposes, uh, it would not slow down the project to return to you to ask for that permission. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, can that go back on consent? 
Mr. Neesmith? <laughs> yes. Okay. I may take it off at the voting meeting, but yes, for Thank now. Thank you. I'll keep Jean busy. Okay. Um, that gets us back to our regular um, new business and the number 11, which is Athens Transit Youth Ridership Program. Ms. Dickers. <laughs> He's going to let me start. Um, I spoke to Commissioner Sims before the meeting. I've talked to a couple of commissioners already about this. Um, I, I think, um, first of all, I think it's a great program that, that we've started getting um, kids to ride more, and I think, you know, they're getting places and whatnot. But as a parent, and some of the comments that we received tonight, um, this is a youth development task force. They're developing as youth. They're going to become adults, understand things cost money. Um, they're using it as a tool. I think this is a great teaching tool. Um, I'm concerned about saying it's free um, because, I mean, I'm raising three boys. They think food on the table is free because they don't pay for it out of their pocket. But I'm trying to teach them that it costs money to do things. I'm not asking, I'm not suggesting that we're talking a full fare. I guess I'm suggesting that we consider a couple things, maybe consider a 25 cent, you know, fare so they have some skin in the game. Um, the thing I think about is there's no value in it if they're not, if they're not invested in it. Um, I shared with a few of my commissioners um, something I saw, I think, on CBS Sunday morning. A gentleman was in Times Square with a placard that said, free hugs. Nobody came up to him at all. They sent somebody out that had a placard that said, hugs a dollar. And he couldn't, get, he couldn't stop giving hugs. He was getting hugs because there was a value. And I think there's value Man, I'm in the start transit charging system. my hugs. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's value. And I'm concerned about saying that, that rides are free. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I would like for my fellow commissioner to consider is, um, is perhaps tabling it till August. I'd like to ask for more data, um, maybe the age of the riders, where they're going, um, if they're going to the park or they're going to work, um, that kind of stuff, just to get a better bearing on it. Um, it's not about the money. $40,000 a drop in the bucket with our budget. I mean, it is, it's something to consider. Obviously, there's lots of nonprofits that'd love to have that $40,000 when we start trying to divvy out money. But I think the issue is more principle-based, just as a parent. I just think it's important that they, they understand there's some value to that. So that's what I would like to offer. Anybody else want to come in on the side, Mr. Gertz? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I certainly understand the kind of philosophical position that Commissioner Dickerson holds, and, and, and I think you've heard that probably on a lot of public goods, but, but I really do see this as a public good in a broad sense. Um, these are youth who are availing themselves of parts of the community they may not be able to easily otherwise. Um, they're able to get to that part, get to that job, get to school if they wake up late, do, do any number of things that I think are going to benefit us broadly and tighten the fabric of Athens. And, you know, if we want to draw parallels, you could think about any other number of public resources for which we're not charging those individual kids, you know, we're not charging them to use the sidewalk on a step-by-step -step basis or, or to ride a bike on the greenway. And, and I really see those as sort of comparable amenities in terms of their youth development. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm in full support of it going ahead as is. Um, I also appreciated the comments made at the podium that did speak to um, school age children and having that ID from the school that shows that they're in school as um, a way to be part of the ridership that doesn't charge. Um, in the last year, the school district, due to the number, or last couple of years, the high number of free and reduced lunch students, it was costing more in time and effort to collect from the few students who did pay for lunch that it's all free and reduced. I mean, it's all free in the school district now. And it has increased the, uh, the students actually going up and getting the food because it's not obvious which line they're in is the free and reduced lunch line as much as they've tried to um, deter that being um, a, an issue in the cafeteria. And I think that students um, are using this because there aren't barriers like that, whether it's that quarter. I mean, nowadays, people used to complain about the coins for the parking meters because people didn't have coins in their pocket anymore. But I think that providing this as a service, and maybe it's the marketing pitch that we need to work on if, if, if calling it free ridership is part of the problem, that maybe it's the service that the community has decided is important to do. And and I, I think it's important, I think, this, that um, the stuff I've been reading about the different details and the destinations have all been good. And unless there's a problem, I think that we should keep going forward with it. Anybody else wish to comment? Mr. Neesmith. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't I, see I you. I agree with uh, everything uh, 
Allison and, and Kelly have said. And I understand Sharon, Sharon's concern, um, but uh, perhaps we should call it complimentary rides or something like that. Uh, we do a lot of things that are free as taxpayers uh, that we've paid for. This is just another one. <clears throat> I, I tend to agree with everybody that's spoken, and I was thinking along the same lines you were, uh, Mr. Nee Smith, that that we might maintain our youth fair, but say we're waiving it for some time frame as as a pilot program or something, so so that people do think about that this is the normal cost, but but the city's waiving it for it, to encourage students to participate in um, wholesome things that they can, and and one of the things that um, that I've thought about about this, and I, actually Jim Thompson, I chatted about a little bit last week, is that I can remember a time that to take my four children on, on to pay a bus fare, you know, of course, gas in the car and all that cost, but you don't, we don't think about that in the same way. But, but to have those dollars available to, to maybe go to an event after you've paid for the fare to get there and the fare to get back might, pro, might have prohibited us going. And so I'm thinking that uh, that there may be parents that will participate in activities with their children that maybe would not have done that before. So we may be promoting more than just youth right ridership. We may be promoting family participation in events together, but also adding some adult fairs to our system at the same time. But I, I totally understand uh, Ms. Dickerson's uh, point, too, is that we don't tend to appreciate things when we think of them as free. And so if we can somehow get that across that this is not free, but it's something that we're providing as a service because we think it's a good, our community is, is a good way to go. So, this Mr. Morning. Sims. Uh, this was enthusiastically endorsed by the uh, Youth Development Community. It was uh, our partnership now. We, we're not a task force anymore, we are a partnership. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but it was, you know, uh, people were really excited about it. This is something that we think. Uh, and I agree with Ms. Dickerson about, you know, ain't nothing in this world free. And I, I was in Jamaica, and, and I was going on a tour, and the lady got on the bus and said, the first thing she said was, there's nothing in Jamaica that's free. And I said, and that's the same way it is in, in life. There's nothing free. It's a cost to somebody. Somebody's paying for it. In this case, it's coming out of the budget of the unified government of athens Clark County to make it happen. Uh, again, uh, like Ms. Dickerson said, you know, we want people to think that, you know, understand that these things have value. You know, how do we get these young people to understand that there is value in, in getting from point A to point B and, and doing it in, in the proper manner and uh, it's the potential of uh, getting you to a job on time. Also, it really is a big, I think that it's a, it would be a big boost for the school district, even though we have maybe three or four schools that don't have transit going to them. But when kids miss the bus, you know, there's no, no, it's really no reason that they can't just get on the city bus <coughs> and get to school, even though if they miss the bus. So it's, so I think this is you know, one of the things that I think that does have some value to it, in in that manner. Uh, again, we, like I said, we were excited about this. Uh, you know, the tech, this uh, our partnership has really just taken off, and, and and a lot of these things have happened. We want to try this for a year. We, you know, we, you know, we. We're gonna come back and look at it, evaluate it for over for a year's time, see how it what it does, see you know, get the data, that, and that's one of the things that Ms. Dickelson wants to see, and I want to see too, is the fact that where are they going? What are the, how are they using? Are we having problems with young people riding the bus? But you know, I was uh, I saw a bus stop this morning, and there were, I guess it must have been 15, 16 young people, under you know, they're probably under the age of eight, that were about were waiting at the bus stop. There was one. Uh, I guess adult with them, so I assume they they were getting ready to go somewhere, but they were waiting at the bus stop. So it is being used, and I think it's, and I think for the most part it's being used in a proper manner. But to get the data and statistics about this, I think that will help us to see how well this is going to go. And I think it does have the potential for us to take it for you know as a as a permanent part of our governmental budget every year. Thank you, Mr. Sims. And since you just spoke, and I think we're about through with this subject, and this relates to the Community Partnership for Youth Development, I want to publicly thank you for chairing that committee because I think it's something really important this community is doing, and I'm not sure the whole community even know, it's go know that it's going on. So thank you, Mr. Sims. 
Um, Mayor, yes, sir. Just a couple of points of information. Uh, one is is that we we will need to amend the budget or the agenda item if you want to put a certain time on the, on the end of it. And secondly, we could find out the data and the ridership patterns when we go through the transit development plan, which is the next step after the master plan we just had. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think that we would be able to have a work session before this time next year to present the results of that data uh, to inform you. So just be thinking about that as you move towards the voting meeting. Okay. And Mr. Sims, if that's something you feel is appropriate, you might want to do a commission to find option. Thank you. We'll talk about it. Okay. Item number 12, anybody else, anything on 11? Item number 12 is Winterville Station uh, Subdivision. Uh, Mr. Neesmith. Yeah, I have some questions. Uh, in the history of this uh, on our uh, report, it states that in November of 2013, TPNW performed a field inspection, prepared a detailed repair list, and calculated the cost of $25,000. That was in November of 13. It wasn't until March 28th of 2016 that the agreement was sent to White Oaks Estates. And then in May, White Oaks, White Oaks Estates executed the agreement. So that's a period of almost three years between the time we estimated a cost and the agreement comes back before us. And in my experience, that's a long time for $25,000 to cover the costs of road construction and sewer repairs and those kinds of things that are listed. So I'm wondering, uh, how, mo how confident are we, I'm not, that $25,000 is going to cover this? Ms. Williams, can you answer Well, that David Clark, our Public Works Director, went back out there in early 2016 and confirmed the cost. He doesn't say that here. And uh, he did that in one of my neighborhoods uh, of a project that was estimated about three years ago and came back, it was about streets, and he came back and the cost had gone up by 15%. So I'm, I'm having a little trouble with this. Well, the nature of the repairs in the subdivision you reference are much different from the nature of the repairs in Winterville subdivision. Uh, the road has had virtually no traffic on it. Um, it's, uh, it's been dormant. Uh, most of what they have had is from um, overgrowth that needs to be cleared and some cracks in the road. It's not significant repairs that are required. Did, uh, did David file any kind of document or report about this? Uh, we did. Well, I, I think it's in the attachment where it's he outlines. Two. Yeah. Is it? <coughs> and I would submit also that, you know, in the last three years, uh, oil prices have gone down considerably, which is a basis for the cost of asphalt as well. Anybody else have a question on this one? Okay, I see that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody, Mr. Mr. Harry. Uh, well, just to, just to follow up, um, I mean, is there a provision here that if it ends up costing us more than $25,000, we can recoup any additional costs from the subdivision owner? I don't think that's part of, of this agreement. Um, can it be made part of the agreement? Well, we, we could certainly do that. What, what we put here is at the very bottom of page 71. It says, by executing this document in the space provided, the property owner is agreeing to pay the full cost of the improvements. Um, so we are estimating it at $25,000. I mean, I, if we want to read it tightly, Bill, um, whatever the full cost ends up being, they're agreeing to pay that, sort of like an estimate. Um, above, but if we want to be more explicit about that, um, we can certainly add that as a commission to find option and talk to the property owner. I mean, alternatively, it could come back less than that, in which case they might even get a rebate. I mean, it seems to me that the fair thing to do is to charge them what it's going to actually cost to do it. Okay. It's a matter of, so, this page has a, he agrees. So the cost necessary for the streets to be improved right away, and it's signed by the own property owner. Yeah, but it's uh, you agree to it. Well, it's not well, we can certainly clarify it's that. Tighten it up. I think it probably needs to be clarified okay. because it says two different things okay. here. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for your eagle eye, Andy. Mr. Smith. Uh, attachment doesn't two doesn't indicate that 
anything has been reinspected. It looks like it's just a restatement of the estimates that were made two and a half years earlier. And with Andy's change, that takes care of your concern too, doesn't it? Um, because because yeah, of the I actual cost. So. Well, David Clark told me that he had been out there, so yeah. I believe him. So what will we need to do that? Will you need to, because the, will the agreement with the property owner need to be amended or changed? And can we do that by voting meeting? We can certainly seek to do that. Okay. Okay, great. Anybody else on item 12? Okay, 13 is the airport commercial terminal, terminal facility uh, contract award. Anybody want to speak to that one? Mr. Neesmith. Um, let me get to this part. Yeah, item... 13 under facts and issues it tells us where this money's coming from. And uh, part of it's coming from Project 10 of the 2005 speed loss program, which is the business corridor infrastructure improvement projects. Um, I mean, that. That's difficult for me to imagine taking money away from a program like that where I think we obviously need the money and putting it into an Air Force airport terminal that at best is window dressing in my opinion. Um, so I'm having a hard time taking money away from a project that where it's needed and put into a project where it's not needed. And while I'm on the subject, back... Uh, <clears throat> When we approved the final plans, one of the conditions was that we would get a quarterly report on the marketing activities uh, of the airport to find a commercial airliner. As I recall, we've had one. Perhaps there's been two, but I only recall one. So I'm not uh, convinced that the uh, efforts to uh, use this terminal are, are, are appropriate, are being put forward, are being in, done in coordination with our economic development department. Uh, so I have great, a great deal of heartburn in moving this money around to that project. Impulse wish, Mr. Campy. Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I, I would agree with Jerry on the on the part about the business infrastructure money. I don't necessarily agree with you on the window dressing part, but uh, but the uh, certainly that infrastructure money, that project's yet to be realized. And uh, we don't know what that holds just yet. I know we've got some promise out there, of, of course, with some maybe potential T spot things, but that hasn't been voted on yet. So I'd prefer not to. I'd, I'd prefer us to look somewhere else for that for that amount of money, uh, if possible. Miss Dickerson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I attended the airport authority meeting today, and I actually at the end of the meeting, um, during the meeting, we were provided um, an update on the airline subcommittee, which is working with um, a scheduled service provider um, and there's a bigger piece of we're sort of there's a lot of fluid parts right now but I did ask um, um, assistant manager Robert Hiss to make that a work session for the mayor and commission because I think it's important um, that an update be provided um, to the commission so y'all know what's going on because if you were at the meeting today you wouldn't have had that comment you wouldn't have made that comment at all Commissioner Neesmith because there's a lot of stuff going on just very fluid right now and there's you have to be careful because obviously you're discussing business opportunities with one vendor another vendor may want to come in you know just it could create a lot of, of issues but but I, I think um, all that said there is some activity in that area um, and and potentially could grow into um, scheduled service um, to New York and DC on a regular basis through through Athens so I think it's important that we get an update so that y'all will have more information and and we'll feel more comfortable but I do agree with both of y'all about taking I don't think it's a good idea to take that money out of that um, the um, business court the corridor project the other monies I don't have an issue with um, I actually think the unearned uh, unallocated interest makes a lot of sense it's one of the projects at the end of the end of the uh, project anyway and that's sort of what the intent of that money should be used for anyway so thank you mr. Gertz and then we'll get back to you mr. 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 Gertz thank you madam mayor just of all the, the funding streams that, that would enter this project, the, the business quarter one is one that, that I have some questions about too. Just given our interest, not only in doing the business quarter project, but in, in recent discussions, expanding the scope of it um, be beyond potentially one or two streets to, to include all of the downtown grid. Um, I, I guess I'd be curious, and you may not know this right now, but just whether we've accumulated enough earned interest in the 2011 SPLOS that some of that could be allocated 
in, in that stream. I, I, I know that we usually like to wait until the end of the SPLOS cycle sure, sure. just to make sure that any increase in cost is covered. Well, um, I don't know the answer to the, how much earned interest we have. And of course, there's plenty of other projects to do left in 2011. Um, and I, I just want to explain uh, the reason why we suggested that is that's basically all the 05 money that's left. We're closing out all the projects and then we're, we're, we're borrowing, so hopefully, from the, um, the, the uh, business improvement district. The hope is, uh, you know, we've got the, the, the SPLOS staff have worked with this contractor before. Uh, they're very confident in their ability and that, that we can have a good project uh, and that the 350000 of contingency, uh, if we can keep our own owner requested change orders down, that maybe we can uh, return a, a good bit of that back to the $6.1 million balance that we have right now. Uh, absent that, uh, if you want us to try to attempt to find another way to fund that, we can certainly do that. Um, we, but I just want to caution you can't take 2011 monies and put them into the 2005 project. Um, uh, we, and I would also say that without reducing the scope significantly, will we bring this project into budget, into the, uh, air, into the amount of money that we wouldn't need the $425,000. So uh, at the very least, if we need to uh, allow us to go back to the uh, contractor and work with them, there's not a lot of BE left um, at all. So why don't you let us think on that? We may find another way to help make up that gap. And I'll communicate that, that to you all in this next week. So, so we'll have some answers from you in time to still consider this for next meeting. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Y'all happy with that? Yeah, I just want to say one more thing, if sure. you could, Madam Mayor. Yeah, um, sure. Go ahead. I, I, think, I think the airport authority and management needs to understand that we asked for a report quarterly. In the last report we got, I said, we need to see more. There wasn't any kind of brochure. There was nothing. There was a very fuzzy presentation. Um, there was no report, very little report about activity. They need to convince us that they're trying, and not just Commissioner Dickerson, but all of us, in order to get this kind of support that they need at times like this. So I want them to, to, to do what we've asked them to do, report on their activities, report on what kind of marketing collateral they're producing, report on how they're cooperating with the Economic Development Department, convince us that they're out there after it. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on this one? Okay. Move on to item number 14, which are, is the North Oconee Greenways uh, project for construction contract. Mr. Nee Smith. Um, well, this is great, except for one thing. The segments that this is, this is going after connect to nothing. Uh, they literally uh, would be long islands of, of, of trailway with no connection to anything else. Um, if, if we were to at least include the, what we call the UGA bridge, at least we would have a connection uh, between segment five, which is going to park and ride, uh, and UGA. Uh, but other than that, there is no connection. These are sitting out there all unattached to anything. So I, I question why why we're doing this like this. Let, let's let the commissioner speak, then that may answer some questions, and we'll get back to you, Brian. Uh, Ms. Wright and yeah. then Mr. Gertz. Well, I, I just want to point out that the staff's recommendation is that we reject the bids and do a rebid on the process. Well, that's another, so that's gives us issue, gives us more time. They're thinking about three months, and then that's where we're going to have a presentation at the next work session about the cemetery section. So the sections are about to line up, uh, but at this point, there it was problematic. It looks like with um, capturing a large number of bid respondents. So um, we are getting more time just by virtue of the recommendation of this. I don't know if that helps. Well, I have a question about that too. If you well, let's, a let's go back to the Mr. Mr. Gertz. Right captured my thoughts. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, anybody else? Mr. Neesmith, go ahead. Uh, about about the rebid, uh, we're rebidding according to the report because the low bidder bid eight dollars and twenty two cents per cubic yard for concrete, when um, more realistic price would be a hundred dollars per cubic yard for the concrete and another hundred dollars 
for the installation, reinforcing form and placement and finishment of the concrete, so making it $200 a cubic yard. The engineer had estimated that the cost would be about $2.7 million. Well, interestingly enough, if you do the math, if we were to go back to this contractor who's offered us 2.3 and say, how about we raise the cost of your cement to $200 a cubic yard, it comes out to the total bid of $2.733 million. So why must we go rebid if we could negotiate with this contractor, tell him his concrete prices are obviously wrong, because he's still going to be the low bidder by about over $300,000 if we can get him up to, to $200,000. Uh, Two hundred dollars per cubic yard. We, we discussed this in the um, in in our meeting, uh, Ms. Williams. I think it, you'd probably give a clear explanation. I would. So if you'll, well, um, while this is is uh, this is a GOD, GDOT uh, process, there's um, qualified contractors, and we need to follow their process. And I'm not sure we have the room to to negotiate. And their recommendation was, you know, we wondered about that. We we asked them, and as you'll see, and uh, facts and issues um, uh, seven or eight that that DOT was oh I'm sorry the history that they um, recommended rebidding the project or considering the next lowest responsive bidder that's history item number 19 sorry and, and one of the things in the discussion Mr. Lee Smith is that when it's such an obvious error you know I, I guess you could hold the contractor to it because you got a legitimate bid but would they would they do the job that yeah, you expect no, them to? And when you rebid, the possibility is that you get an even lower bid when you're rebidding again, which is what I believe happened in, in one of the jail bids, didn't it? When we had to rebid, we, yeah, we came back with an overall lower bid. So, but and and to to Commissioner Gertz and Wright's point, um, you know, first off, the bridge segment has a separate pot of DOT money, and you know that's been going on for years, and they have to reappropriate that money. To be available because what they'll do each year is they'll take projects that are, are coming along slow and they'll make sure funds are getting spent it's not just sitting there in the bank waiting for you so that's that's lagging a little bit but we've worked very hard for segments two and four to come online as soon as one three and five and right now we're about i believe it's about six months difference in completing those and as they have pointed out that this delay will bring it closer to the completion time should everything work out for those processes that's great news Everybody okay with this one? Mm -hmm. I have number 15 is our co op. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't. No. no, leave it on discussion. Leave it on discussion, yes, ma'am. Uh, item number 15, Cooperative Extension Service Center, site location. Would anybody like to open that discussion? Or do you have any discussion? Well, uh, <laughs> Are y'all just going to say what? Chairman with of the Site Selection Committee. Thank you, Mr. Sims. And uh, we have, uh, and I want to thank Ms. Bell who has tirelessly, lessly, exhausted every avenue that was possible for us to look at the property on the University of Georgia campus. You know, it's kind of, you know, I don't, know, I don't want to make our partner at the university angry with me, but the fact is the corporate extension is a product of the University of Georgia, and it's not a product of athens Clark County. So, you know, sometimes you would think that, well, maybe since it's the University of Georgia and this University of Georgia property, that we might have a chance of happening. That did not happen. I mean, we looked at a site on Millage Avenue, and uh, I think uh, the old dean, the new dean, and every other dean that was talked to uh, finally, and it finally came down to it. And I thank uh, our staff, too, because our staff did make some, make some changes and look at where, uh, location and all of this to make it happen, it did not happen. And we have a, a recommendation that, uh, that came from the, from the uh, Site Selection Committee, whereas you know, a, a joint property, as much as corporate extension people would much rather be closer in, the reality of it is I am not in it comfortable at all making a recommendation of having a smaller project for corporate extension. Corporate extension is a very vital part of this community and they need to have what they need to have. And for, you know, you know, I know the director said that, you know, we could take a smaller building if we could put it somewhere. Now, I, you know, it's just, that's not fair to, to them. They are already in a hole now. 
and we want to give them the proper facility that they need. And right now, the only way that I see that happening is we do the joint venture out on the Cleveland Road with the fire department, and the fire station, and, and them doing, working on that same piece of property. And this is going to stay on discussion because I know Ms. Link is going to be back in our vacation, and we will have another discussion about this. But right now, that would be the recommendation that I would be would like to I would bring forward that we do this joint venture in order to you know for economy of scale. Uh, we are still going to not recover all the money that we would like to have recovered by virtue of the fact that the property on Mitchell Bridge, where the current fire station is. Uh, we probably won't be selling it to the, the Department of uh, Transportation at the price we would like to because they're going to be making some adjustments to the road. And uh, as good partners and good friends and to keep everybody happy, we would uh, let them have it at a, a better price than it really should be. And, of course, hope, hopefully we'll be able to sell the uh, building where corporate extension does exist now to actually help offset some of the costs of of constructing these two particular facilities. Thank you, Mr. Sanderson. Mr. Bailey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I do appreciate the work that Commissioner Sims and all the members of the Selection Committee did. That did fine work. And I know that Commissioner Bell worked trying to, to convince the university to, uh, to help us in the location of this facility on their property. But Despite all those efforts, I still firmly believe that that is not the best location for our cooperative extension. I think it needs to be much more accessible for the clients. I think it needs to be more centrally located. I understand what the, the uh, committee went through with the, the challenges. I do. I appreciate that. But, but I just can't support it being there. Uh, Fire station, of course, makes total sense to be there, but cooperative extension office needs to be in a place that's very accessible to as many people in our community as possible. Thank you. Mr. Gertz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, well, well, I guess I remain somewhat open-minded. I guess I want to revisit some points that we've discussed over the last couple of years. And one is that we, we have the benefit, really, of being in geographically the smallest county in the state in which any two points are relatively close to one another. So um, you know, I tend to work all over the state these days, and when I'm in Putnam County or Washington County or Hancock County, um, the, the distance between any two points are, are, are much more significant. Um, as it happened, I had to run out um, and buy some office supplies for some of the training I'm running this week. and. So I took that opportunity this afternoon to also travel from downtown, downtown Athens to, to this site. And so headed out West Broad Street toward Atlanta Highway, <coughs> past the current location of the Cooperative Extension at 440 this afternoon. Uh, 447, I found myself on Atlanta Highway over the Loop 10 Bridge. And at exactly 450, I arrived at the location of this prospective cooperative extension and, and fire station. So I, I just want to make it generally clear that I think sometimes our, our sense of space in Athens can certainly be distorted simply because we're a very small county. And, you know, if we're going more than six blocks, I think sometimes we perceive it as being a long distance, while in fact it's, it's not such a long distance at all. Um, the, the other thing in some of the correspondence I've received, um, termed this location as an industrial park and um, I also just want to sort of describe the, the contours of the landscape there essentially as you go down Atlanta Highway you have a series of businesses the mall um, banks um, eateries and, and you take a right turn on on Cleveland and th there are a series of office buildings and then some unused land so, so really it's an office park you know you're not wedged between a poultry plant and a um, and a manufacturing facility. It's, it's just not that kind of environment. So I just I want to make that clear early in this discussion because of some of the comments that I've gotten in emails based on sort of social media and email chains that have been circulating. Thank you, Mr. Gertz. Uh, Mr. Sure. Uh, just just a couple points I wanted to make that everybody's made some good points. And, uh, you know, certainly um, corporate extension deals with a lot of people in our community, a lot of farmers, a lot of 4-H'ers uh, and master gardeners. I actually have a good friend who's a master gardener, 
who's uh, taught me the difference between a tulip and a, and a daffodil. So who knew? They all look wow. the same to me. So, so. Your so, knowledge of that must have been staggering. It must have been. So, uh, so at any rate, uh, it, uh, they, they, they bloom. That's all I know. Um, but and Amanda Tidro has, has uh, done a great job with a, in a facility that's been there for 40 years. Uh, and certainly needs an upgrade and needs expansion. And that's the point, uh, if uh, Commissioner Sims brought it up about uh, the UGA discussion. If you all remember, that was a big discussion about us. Uh, sort of being hesitant about putting on SPLOS to begin with, uh, just uh, as far as how we how we interact with cooperative decision. It's a shared resource between us and the University of Georgia, and uh, and uh, I think you know they came in and wanted a, a bigger building and a, a pavilion. We weren't able to do the pavilion for them, but we hopefully will be able to do a, a larger facility for them, which was the main selling point that attracted us to adding this to the to the SPLOS package. And that's what uh, Commissioner Sims brought this up. I just, I feel like we were we were not doing justice to the SPLOS project description or the program if we weren't honoring what was in what was in uh, brought for, before us as far as uh, as far as their application. And I actually, you know, I'm not usually a hoarder, but I do sort of keep things laying around. And uh, and I actually just was able to put my hands. I don't know how I did it. It just I just sort of laid my hands on this particular project request form from 2011 and uh, and I knew I had it somewhere I just couldn't find it there's a lot of s stuff that I've lost <laughs> that I wish I could find again but uh, my marbles being one of them <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, the uh, <laughs> the thing I wanted to the thing that I've noticed in this project request form is all through this is you know the size uh, being able to accommodate a 200 space meeting facility which would be great for for that part of town because there's not a meeting facility of that of that size on that part of town being able uh, to accommodate uh, 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 the parking and the and and, and the traffic and, and whatnot but uh and uh, of course enough space for for the 16 staff the building that was built now was built for four people uh, so why would we build another building the same size that's built for four people? Um, the thing I wanted to, and we've had a lot of discussion about this too, or some emails that have come across about the distance time, and Commissioner Gertz touched on this, but I'll just read a, uh, from a sentence here, and these are their words, and I'll, I'll plagiarize them, um, that, uh, that says, let me see, what it, where did I see it here? Um, it says the building will only seat 20 people comfortably, so when larger classes are held, space has to be located elsewhere. Currently, through an arrangement with Oconee County Extension Office, we're able to use the Oconee County Civic Center for most of our large classes. Even though the distance is short to the Oconee County Civic Center, this requires athens Clark County citizens to travel out of county for these services. And, uh, you know, I just, I mean, this was part of the application, so I'm wondering if the distance was short to Oconee County, why it would not, why it's long to, <laughs> to the mall. Uh, but, and that's, you know, that, again, this goes back to us honoring what we were told as far as putting this on the SPLOS package uh, to, be, to be part of it. And it, it works out that, it, that it's going to help us hopefully save some, some good money in the long run, we, we, we just discussed an item that's needing more money because we delayed in building it. Uh, or we took, we had to answer some questions first from 2005. The construction costs have gone up. You know, the, the delay in this, if we delay this and not hop on it while the, the bird in the hand, so to speak, then, then we will realize and we will meet the obligations of SPLICE by, by providing a building that, they, that has been asked for that includes the 200 seat auditorium uh, and we will be able to, uh, to to meet the demands, not of the clients of, of, I mean, we can meet the clients of today, but, you know, we're, we're building these buildings 5, 10, 20 years to, to meet those. We did it for the Classic Center, and, you know, fortunately we had to do it for the jail. I mean, we don't, and, and so we need, to, we need to do some things to, to look down the line, and I think this will help us serve clients not only of today, but, but um, uh, 20 years from now, too. Mr. Harry, can get back. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I agree that it, it's unfortunate that um, we haven't been able to find a site closer to the center of town. Um, and I, since the beginning of this, had said that I would like to see this on the east side of town. But at the same time, um, in order to do that, we're talking about an additional $800,000, at least according to the, the report. So 
I guess I have two questions for our staff, and I would like the responses, and I see you're fiddling with some maps down there at the moment, but I would like to know for um, to get a map of where the people who use this facility, where they're coming from, are they coming, obviously some are coming from athens Clark County, but I'm assuming some are coming from other parts of the, of the area. Um, maybe we have that and I can't, un unlike Commissioner Hamby, uh, I can't find either my marbles or the report. Um, but, um, but I would like to see where people are coming from and to know, for example, are peop more people coming from the Oglethorpe Elberton side of the county versus the Barrow Jackson side of the county, for example. So I would like that um, information. And the other is, um, you know, we always talk, we've just been talking about um, uncommitted um, interest and uh, other fundings. And I understand this is a 2011 speed loss project and we've got a lot of other things to build, but are there other sources of funding within 2011 or some other speed loss that we could possibly put towards this? <coughs> Mr. Williams, I think we'll, that question was addressed to you. We will seek to find uh, the maps that you're describing. Uh, and certainly being 2011, um, and we're not ready to release the jail contingency you've left, but that, that is a source of funding uh, that uh, is, is larger than expected. Mr. Neesmith? Well, I've been I'll playing with maps. <clears throat> it is uh, via Atlanta Highway. Uh, it is nine minutes, 4.1 miles from the existing cooperative extension to the proposed new one. From Cedar Shoals High School, it is 11.8 miles from Cedar Shoals High School to the new proposed location, taking 19 minutes. From Cedar Shoals High School to the current location, it is six miles and it takes 18 minutes. That's because you can get to the new one on the loop, the proposed one on the loop. So I think the idea of it being inconvenient is a matter of perception. I live out there. I go by this location two, three, four times a day uh, on the weekends, on the way to Lowe's. <laughs> um, but this is, again, it's not an industrial setting at all. There are residences around there. Uh, it's a nice wooded area. Uh, Burton and Burton are out there with their nice office and warehouse facility. So I don't think being located at this location is a hardship. It's just a perce perceived hardship. Ms. Dickerson. Yeah, um, so I'll echo um, what Kelly Gert said as well, Commissioner Gert said as well as um, Commissioner Neesmith, and I guess even Commissioner Hamby mentioned this. Um, I actually measured it myself. Um, I, from my house, and I'm pretty far out, I'm out on Morton Road, I'm pretty much either Oconee or Oglethorpe, just step, just a fur, uh, step over in line. It was 23 minutes to the current location from my house. It's 11 miles, but because I have to go through town, it'd take me 23 minutes. If I got on the loop to the new location, it would be 18 miles, but it, took me, it would take me 23 minutes to do it by the loop. So, you know, that's important, but it's not, I don't think that's going to change people, people who are going to the cooperative extension are going there it's a destination i guess is my point you're going there because you have to go or you want to go i will i would like to point out though since this is a good opportunity to point out that there are unintended consequences to our land use plan and the fact that we are pushing everything into town there are no available locations really central to town that will meet the needs of this of this um facility and so you have to go out i mean we really don't have much choice um what's available and i think the committee i feel pretty confident the committee's exhausted I mean, we got several different work sessions i had the manager's office sent me the one from August that gave all the list of locations they looked at. So I think they looked at those, and, and you know, I, I like to rely on our citizens committee to, to vet these things, and I think they've done a good job, as much as I would like to see it on the east side too, because obviously the east side is pretty much known for ag, you know, um, lots of farmers, and there's pretty, I mean, there are some farmers on the west side, but the majority of them are on the east side. So I'd like to see that, but I don't think, I think the trade-off is too great. We need the facilities. And as somebody who was a staff member who built a facility, who wished she'd built it five times larger, I don't see that a staff member should take that, you know, I mean, a staff member needs to understand how important that is um, because the program's gonna grow. And we're in a, we're, our societies get more organic, you know, looking at composting and all sorts of things that, opportunities that this this uh, organization, this group could could provide to our citizens. So it's a trade-off and it's not necessarily something that, you know, I'd like to trade off, but I think it's important that they get the that they get the facility they need the first time. 
Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Mr. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to say, uh, in response to Commissioner Hamby, I do believe that this facility needs to be everything that they asked for, that we need to be building the right facility, that we don't need to be trying to squeeze it into the wrong space or cut back on it. I don't think we need to do that disservice to the Cooperative Extension. I'm supportive of, of the, uh, the plan to put the facilities that are needed in the right space. But I just think it's more than a perception. It's true this is a small county, and you can get places relatively easy. But as we grow, it does become more and more difficult to get around. It's, it's not like it was 20 years ago. And uh, personally, I, uh, I don't go out to the mall area if I ha don't have to because there's more traffic and it's further out there and everything else. It's just me. But I don't think it's just a perception. I think we need to have this service that we provide to citizens in, jointly with the University of Georgia needs to be more centrally located if possible. And it's not just that it's out past the mall, it's off the beaten path past the mall too. So it's, to me it's more than a perception. I think it just needs to be more centrally located. And I know that the committee has looked at lots of options. and This is the only viable one they, they have found, but I just think it needs to be in a different place. And I don't have an answer for where that place is, but I, I heard what people said, the other commissioners, and they made valid points, but I still think it needs to be in a more accessible location. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Anybody else before we move, move on? Or have we exhausted the subject for now? Okay, we'll go to our planning items. Come up, Mr. Griffin. Jimmy Daniel Road. Special use is for a congregate personal care home in an R1 zone. Uh, total of 130 units with 181 beds. Uh, 45,000 square foot building. Three stories in the front, four to the rear on about eight acres that's being cut out of approximately 28 acres of a development that was originally started and still is Ridge Point. There was a portion of Ridge Point built, and I'll show you the overall original plan in just a minute, but um, this property actually encompasses about eight acres of one of the southern corner of the developed portion of the original Ridge Point tract. There are two variances that will need to be voted on separately as part of the special use uh, at your August meeting. Uh, those two variances being a, a building height increase from 40 foot to an average of 43. This is largely to cover uh, we measure our building heights based on average, and with the three-four split, the four being the rear down the hill, it far exceeds that 40-foot height, which pushes the average up over, which is driving the need for the variance. That tall building elevation actually backs into dedicated open space and really is not an impact on any adjacent development. And then there is a small amount of parking between the building and the front right-of-way that I'll show you in a minute as well. Uh, this is the southern portion of the Ridge Point development. You see it's at the corner of the Creek Ridge Lane entrance at Jimmy Daniel Road. You can see the, the tract was originally developed from a standpoint of clearing and grading. There was some road construction put in. The single family and townhomes that are currently in place are just to the north off of the screenshot here. Uh, and the balance of all of that property that you see cleared and graded at this point with some limited infrastructure was 
the original plan called for, I think it was 27 apartment buildings that I don't know, don't remember the exact number of units, but it was somewhere between 300 and 350 units of apartments that was designed and in, in what kicked off the original. The installation of this congregate personal care home would eliminate six of those apartment buildings. Here's the existing Creek Ridge Lane entrance off of Jimmy Daniel Road. You see just at the far point, that's where Jimmy Daniel turns into New Jimmy Daniel at the intersection. Uh, this is the overall development. The You've been to Ridge Point. The single family homes that are built are right in this location. Um, they're basically on both sides here. There are some of the townhomes here that were put in initially. There was a green space that provided some limited separation between the single family, but from this point all the way over, what you see are multifamily buildings. Um, and again, probably I think it was 330 units total. Uh, the red outline there is the portion that is being requested for special use consideration. Um, and what I'm going to show you here, the, the building site plan actually is rotated. Um, that building is sitting actually facing north east on the site, but from a context standpoint, this being Jimmy Daniel Road and that entrance that comes in and that building sits facing to the bottom right. If I can get my air up, yeah. it kind of sits in like this, facing that direction into the intersection. And you can see the topography as it falls away down to the open space. Uh, elevations, the front on the top, the four-story elevation to the rear. Uh, Planning Commission recommendations for variances and special use are to approve variances approved with conditions, the special use permit with some limited conditions. Um, there needs to be an amended preliminary plat to create the new parcel. Uh, there was a, a request for expanded buffer screening and provide screening for right side of the building elevation. <laughs> and for the developer to provide any needed street right-of-way improvements. We don't at this point have the full traffic impact analysis given the change from multifamily to this type of use, which is a, a significant reduction in trips. There really wasn't a need to drive that at this point for special use permitting, but if there are any improvements needed as this goes through permitting, if this is approved, it will be required by the developer to provide that. Uh, there was some initially some concern from the current single-family residents in Ridge Point, when, when the signs went up and the notices went out initially with this, uh, we did have discussions with some of those people. We reached out to the developer, and it's our understanding the developer did hold a meeting a month or two ago with those neighbors. We did not have anybody in attendance to speak in opposition at the Planning Commission after that meeting was held. So I'm assuming, I think a couple things happened. They really didn't have a clear understanding of what was being proposed, and I think the bigger issue was you know, unfortunately, I think the majority of the single-family residents that moved into Ridge Point had no idea that the balance of the southern portion of that development was all multifamily. Um, and once they learned that, I think they became much more comfortable with this kind of substitution on at least a portion of, of that multifamily development. And with that, it was a unanimous recommendation to approve. Things are happening on the west side. <clears throat> Cool. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, I'm going to support this uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, the the, the no, maximum cool. height, uh, as uh, as Brad said, is simply caused by the fact that there's a drop off in the back and it becomes four stories, but it's still the same 40 foot roof on the front, uh, and the front yard parking is necessary because this is a place where people who can't get around very well come and live, and uh, so they have visitors. So they need to have some front yard parking in the, the covered uh, drop-off pickup point there as well. Um, I attended the meeting that John Williams had with the residents okay, of, uh, of that subdivision, and, and what Brad reports is exactly correct. Uh, they were very surprised to know that uh, the rest of that subdivision was approved to be uh, multifamily. And so when they saw this, they, they saw it as, uh, as something very acceptable. Uh, and 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 uh, a, a, a good thing for a, at least a neutral thing for their neighborhood. I think this will help the development of that neighborhood and also the neighborhood the neighborhood to the northwest of it. Um, 
So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to support this. Okay. Um, I'm in support of this as well. I really like the idea of them not having those apartment complexes and that this is coming in. It's a very needed um, commodity. The um, prime senior living. Can you answer to me? Is it independent living or is it a mixture of independent living and assisted living as far as the senior category? Did, it's my you know understanding about that? that it is a it's. The, the model of this company, it's really kind of a hybrid okay. between some level of independent living and, and transitioning into the true assisted living model. Okay. Um, I think there, there, are, there are some units in there, I believe, that may even have some, some small kitchen, galley-type okay. kitchens in them, but then certainly other units are the t more traditional assisted living-type unit that does not have any kitchen. Gotcha. So there is a, a cooking facility and the staffing for it. Yes. So you've got um, potentially the residents who are fine there and don't need to venture out. And then you have some. Anyway, it's a yes. mixture in that respect. And like you say, the visitors for that. Um, spending too much of my time with um, senior living. And with my birthday coming up, I'm trying to get in a feel. I think we need more of these around here. Um, make sure they're good. And this one looks looks Young good. people can kill me with <laughs> Maybe learning more than, more than you thought you wanted to know. I'm, I'm learning every day, yeah. every day. Anyone else wish to speak to this one? Uh, Mike Canby wants to go ahead and put his name in so he can go there now. I'm, I'm ready to retire right now. Yeah. And you can find your marbles there. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. Get the bus out there. We'll point your tulips and daisies. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. okay. Brad, I think we're ready to move forward with the next one. All right. The next item is a type one rezone, which includes a future development map amendment at 202 and 204 Firefighter Court to amend our future development map component of our comprehensive plan from a community institutional designation to traditional neighborhood, and then a straight rezone request from RS8 single family to a combination of commercial general and commercial neighborhood. Uh, Two parcels totaling 2.65 acres at this point with it being a straight rezone there are no proposed uses uh, the applicant has it's its intended use at this point to use the existing facility on the property for a office use they existed in a downtown office for a period of time here in Athens and wish to have their own place and own it this became an opportunity for them that they were very interested in and so they have sought the zoning is required, even though it has been a non-residential use for many, many years, as I believe it was the Whitehead Civitan Club. Mm -hmm. um, and it still periodically, I think, holds some special events in it. Um, to change it from an office is not a permitted conversion of a use if it's zoned single family. So this was something they had to do to pursue their intended use. Uh, there you see the property. It's located behind <laughs> Jeffy's Motor Works at the cul-de-sac on Firefighter Court and actually is accessed through uh, the auto repair business, which is right here. Um, you see that from an aerial photo, the driveway for the use, even though the property has some really limited frontage on Firefighter Court, largely for provision of utilities, the driveway access comes through an easement right here and the owners of the Motor Works Company actually appeared in the Planning Commission before the Planning Commission has spoken in support of the change of zoning. I believe they actually live in the neighborhood to the right in Putters as well. Uh, we did have con some, some concerns initially, especially with it being a straight rezone with proximity of some of these single family houses in Putters subdivision. Uh, the applicants did hold a neighborhood meeting with these residents and um, Actually, I think what the, the biggest concern the residents had was that generally a change of use to commercial would have required a landscape buffer that included a six foot fence and they did not want a fence. Um, that's not part of this request and our understanding that the applicant will pursue a variance if this zoning is successful when they go through permitting to seek a modified buffer at the request of the neighborhood as well. You see a shot looking from the, from the west to the existing building, and that is the driveway that I showed you off of Firefighter Court that accesses into the property. Uh, there will be a need for some parking lot improvements, handicap accessible spaces have to be provided as well, uh, but really no other intended changes at this point. 
community institutional and traditional neighborhood or the current future development classifications, community institutional largely uh, based on the 2000 comprehensive plan and the existing use of the property at that time. The request is to change to traditional neighborhood, which you see on the right, uh, which is really compatible with the surrounding area to the south, which is largely residential. And then the proposed zoning change from the RSA to commercial neighborhood. Planning Commission recommendations for both future development and the rezoning are straight approvals. There are no conditions associated with this request. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I've spoken with uh, Jeff Snowden, and I'm familiar with this property. I used to attend meetings at the Sid Van Club for the Clark County Wildlife Association, and the space is underutilized and is actually uh, had been uh, the target of some vandalism because it's underutilized. Uh, so having a new business entity move in there will be good. The Citivan Club is disbanded, by the way. They didn't have enough members. Uh, so the property is not being used much. These folks want to come in with their, it's an ad agency, basically, a marketing company, uh, come in there and move their offices from downtown to there and uh, make the, the building, bring it up to code and, and uh, make very few changes though. And uh, I think it would be very good to have a, a tenant there, an entity there that's, that's uh, watching the property and taking care of it because uh, I think it has the potential to be a problem piece of property because it's kind of hidden back in there. But um, one of the reasons it's zoned residential is basically this building was built before we had zoning, and it just got the residential zoning from the surrounding areas. Isn't that correct? It's my understanding, okay. yes. But it, it probably should have been zoned commercial anyway because of the, the current use. But uh, I'm in support of this. I think it's a, a good use for the property. I think that the, the company, which I'm familiar with both principals in the company, uh, I think they will be good stewards of that property. They've already purchased it. And I think the use will be a, an asset to that area. And I think it will be beneficial to the neighborhood, too, to have good tenants in there. So I'm planning to support it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I don't have a, a, a problem with this, and I'm happy to support it, but I do have a question. So looking at the, the two maps, um, and I'm looking at, at uh, Q Public on my computer right now. So the, the road or the driveway or whatever it is that currently accesses that piece of property um, is, if you go back to the map, Brad. <laughs> no, the other one that we started off with, the colored one. I like the colored one, oh, where yeah. it was, I'm sorry. Yeah. So that is not where that pink little strip is where you've got the black arrow That's from right. the right-hand right. side. Was that little, which looking on this looks like it's about 20, 25 feet wide, was that supposed to be a road originally, do you know? Why is that little strip of? Make sure we're. That one right this there. This strip right yes. here. It's, that it's was, that was property that was acquired, as it's my understanding, for provision of utilities. Okay. To get to the, get to the right of way. Okay. Yes, no, there was, I don't know that there was ever a road in that location, there are utilities in that in that mm. portion of the property which they own. Uh -huh. um, and with it being able to touch existing right of way, it gives them the ability to, to tie a private line off instead of doing public mains into okay. the property. Okay. But there is there is an easement on Japanese Motor Works access okay. easement okay. in the location of the driveway where I showed you on the aerial photo. Okay. So on um, what's being proposed, and as I say, I don't have a problem with it, I'm just asking the question. On the left-hand side, we, the main part of the property is uh, currently zoned residential, that kind of yellow mm -hmm. color, and that little strip is, col is colored red for commercial general. Yes. Now the whole piece of property is going to be colored for a commercial neighborhood pink. So on fire firefighter court, all of that is going to be red except for yes. one 20, 25-foot wide strip. Does that <laughs> cause any issues? You know, we, we talked about this internally at, a, at staff level, and we could have, I think we could have totally done it either way. Uh, the reason we chose to, to recommend and talk to the applicant about the little pink strip is to try to discourage split zone mm -hmm. because it's all one property. 
we would have then ended up with a property that actually had a split zoning designation on it, and it just seemed to be cleaner and we did to give it all the C and zone instead of a split. Okay. But th I think it could have worked either way. Okay. Well, I mean, it seems like it's six of one and a half a dozen the other, because I, I, I know on some that. other locations we don't like to have separate zoning categories like that on the single same street. So, so and if, and if, if it was a zoning classification that would have negatively impacted the CG zone, the red on either side, I mm -hmm. think we'd have probably felt different about it. But um, it, it really, with that being CN instead of CG, it does not drive okay. any additional requirements for the adjacent properties. Okay. Anybody else? Sure. Just, just a clarification um, from Brad. Um, so prior to this zoning, it basically was non-conforming, correct? Yes. So it was being used for one purpose, but not really zoned that way. So he's basically doing us a favor by getting it up to, up to code, right? It has been a legal non-conforming use for many, many years. And yes, by doing this, it's, it's allowing him to get it into a zoning classification that then allows him to bring the property up to code. Okay, thank you. Mr. Neesmith. Yeah, my, um, the, <clears throat> the petitioner did not volunteer any uh, use restrictions uh, to add any. So whatever comes along with CN would be allowed here, which include, um, according to the report, retail sales and service, professional services and office, vehicle repair, bakery, church, business school, trade school, daycare, nursing home. So I'm wondering, I'm looking in the future and wondering if maybe the uses of this shouldn't be a part of the conditions. And I think it's a fair question, and, and we tried to touch on it a little bit in our report, uh, and you're correct. He did not request any changes. Um, the CN is, is, is not ultra-restrictive in terms of uses, but a lot of the uses that you listed are size-limited to. Auto repair is 2,500 square feet, is as large as you can be, for example, with auto repair. I think restaurant is a use, but limited at 10,000, which is still a pretty big building. But um, the reason that we didn't raise any more of an issue with it as part of the staff recommendation largely was based on this lack of visibility and, and, and the probable lack of it being a real viable high traffic commercial use because honestly you really can't see it unless you know it's back there. Um, I would imagine the neighbors on Stableford would uh, disagree with that. Uh, it's in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Uh, literally uh, very close to their backyard. It's very close to the back of their so house. So I'm, I'm not so sure that that's, uh, I'm not so sure they don't need protection. And uh, I went to the planning commission meeting for this and, and limiting the uses was not discussed at all, which really, really surprised me. I mean, we're, here we are going to do a straight rezone without a, without a PD, which we just hardly ever do. Uh, and without any use limitations, re use restrictions, additional use restrictions, which I've really never seen us do. I can't recall one. Um, so, you know, I, I really think we need to think about some, some use limits in this for the protection of those, those neighbors. Anybody else? Okay. Bradfield, walk us through the next one, then we'll finish I up. I will. The next <laughs> item is a text amendment. Like this is one that like you had presented to you several months ago regarding the size of accessory structures uh, within our zoning ordinance. And you had concerns. That at that point, the way we presented it to you was in lieu of the current language, it says you get 25% of the size of your house in allowable accessory structure. We were requesting to go to 50% and to give everybody up to a total of 800 square feet minimum, even if it was more than the 50%. I think the 50% number, not to put thoughts into your into your mind, but I think that's where you started to get a little concerned in terms of potential size and asked us to go back and look at some other options. So we did that, um, did some research of other municipalities around the state as well as a couple other um, that we look to often in terms of what they're doing, those two being Greenville, South Carolina, and Asheville, North Carolina, and we've given you that list of I mean, you can see there, they're, they do it all different kinds of ways uh, in different cities. Um, but we really thought that the table approach, we did. We, we gave the Planning Commission two approaches. One approach very similar to what we presented to you the first time with a few minor changes. And then the second approach being very similar to what Asheville, North Carolina currently does, which is a table largely based on lot size in, in lieu of just 50% of the structure. And what that table would say, 
basically is, well, let me get to ours and read it. Breaks it down into three classifications. If you have a lot that is less than a half an acre in size, regardless of the zoning classification, 800 square feet maximum, you get up to 800 square feet as long as it is it remains smaller than the principal structure. So if you've got a 700 square foot house on in the first category on a lot that's a quarter of an acre, you can't do an 800 square foot accessory. But you get up to 800 if you go up to half an acre, lots that are a half acre to an acre, 1,200 square feet, mm -hmm. and then more than an acre, 1,600 square feet. And then we've also continued to include the language under definitions that kind of removes the loophole of the very long connection between buildings to get out from under the size restriction, um, and then just cleaned up a little bit of additional language as well. But uh, of the two options that we presented the Planning Commission, and this is one for your information that, that we went three rounds at least with the Planning Commission and after you sent it back to us yeah they started to have more discussion and really had the same concerns and and I think they landed on this one with a comfort level that uh, that they could get behind and so they recommended to you or are recommending at this point with a unanimous vote to consider the option as presented to you tonight discussion Ms. Ron um, I, I appreciate the work that's been put into this and um, being able to compare by reading this with the information that you presented to them. Um, the part about the setback not being in here is confusing to me. Is the term, like if on page 142 in the proposed ordinance where it says regardless of the side or rear yard requirements of the district, is that setback requirements? Yep. Yes. Is that what that's talking about? In a residential district, a side or rear yard setback may be reduced to three feet. Is that is that yes. covering the setback? That, be, that it seems like the word setback is missing, and that just maybe is mine. The, the side or rear yard requirement are the setbacks, okay. uh, regardless of those in those residential districts, which are your RSRM districts. Uh, they can be reduced to three feet. Now that's side yard. That's reducing from six feet to three. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not an extensive setback to start with for a principal structure. So it's a reduction from six to three on your sides and generally a reduction from 10 to three on the rear, provided that that structure is no taller than 15 right. feet. And that's really close for a new accessory building to be mm -hmm. in a property line. And I was curious how the conversation went, because it seems to me like the bulk of the examples you brought forward had five feet. And th three seems really close mainly because in my district I'm dealing with some very frustrated neighbors with all of a sudden three feet up close and personal so with a new building so how did the conversation go through planning on setback I mean there were really some opinions on both sides uh, one of the options that one of the revisions that we proposed to them where that language says that if it is as long as it's no more than 15 feet in height we proposed a change to them that said as long as the structure is no more than 15 feet in either height, width, or depth, meaning that if any dimension yeah. of it exceeded 15, you had to meet full setbacks. There was a lot of concern largely with the number of potential non-conforming structures that were going to be created um, if they changed it at this point for something that small. Oh. So that's really, that language is basically the same language that's existed since adoption in 2000. So that if you did start going down that road, it would end up having a lot of grandfathered in yes. type thing. And I guess that's we've been We've probably. been permitting them under that provision for 16 years. And so any of those structures, which the majority, with the exception of the two-story carriage house type garage. Yeah are not 15 feet and, and we've got a lot of them out there that are going to be inside of full setbacks in districts and so then that would they become be, non-conforming. Yeah, so if somebody wants to build their accessory building 20 feet high, they then don't. it's got to be within the building setbacks, not yes. this, this. So that's where those are sort of a check and balance. Mm -hmm. That, um, okay, thank you. But Brad, it doesn't prohibit those carriage, two-story carriage house type things. They just have to have the greater setback. Is that correct? That's correct. Anybody else? Just, um, Mr. Neeson. Oh, Uncle Nicole. Yeah, I have, I have great concern about the three-foot setback. Um, it doesn't bother me so much that if we changed it to a different one, we would have non-conforming uh, uh, construction. 
Uh, I'm working. I mean, we're giving a lot here. We're giving the ability to build um, much bigger accessory buildings and maybe even more of them. So, um, why why not uh, re increase the setback? And Allison and I'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, I, I you know I live kind of in the suburbs, and so uh, I have lived in cities before, and I just cannot imagine a three foot setback from my backyard neighbor or my side neighbor. It just that would that would concern me a great deal. Um, just a clarification. So no more than 15 feet in height, total height or mid midpoint of the roof. How's that work? Midpoint of the roof. Okay. And then, um, but so this is only specific to if you're, if you want to get closer to them, if you want to be less, if you want to be closer to the property line, this call, call, falls in place. What if you're in line? What is the rule for, for the height of a structure? And the a underlying resident? height of the zoning district. It'll okay. put you up to about 30 in most of your residential districts. It, it, with your property, for example, if you were wanting to do a garage that was over 15 feet on your side yard, you would simply just have to move it over an additional three feet from where you could if you were over 15 feet. Mm -hmm. you would, Actually, you may be a little bit more because you're ag, but in the in-town zones, um, it would go from three to six. Okay. Else having needing clarifications. Thank you, Eric. Madam. I just have one question, just so that I'm, I'm clear, and other people are, are clear, or maybe they already are. So, when we're talking about an accessory structure, are we talking about something that people can live in, or are we just talking about garden sheds and that kind of stuff? We are talking about garden sheds, garages. Um, they can be. They can be overnight accommodations, but they cannot have, they cannot meet the definition of a dwelling unit, so which means kitchen. no kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, the, the intent of, of this modification was only to change the size, the way we measure sizes mm -hmm. does not change the uses whatsoever. There's been a lot of talk out in the community about wanting to, to revisit the issue of accessory structures as secondary dwellings, mm -hmm. but there's nothing in this proposed amendment that allows okay. that, and we don't allow that today so they could have uh, showers and that kind of stuff but just no kitchen and and we have seen that it could have a living space a bedroom and a bath with no kitchen and it would be permissible what about things like um, microwaves hot plates those kinds of things that's not technically a kitchen that's not technically a kitchen you know and that's is, is I think as we move through this comprehensive plan process that's one of those things that's kind of up on the radar that we need to look at you know this is the language of no kitchen really comes out of the of the 90s you know in terms of the way we've regulated and we've largely regulated no kitchen meaning no stove mm -hmm. you know the technology's changed so much from what it was 10 or 15 years ago you know I, I understand you can probably put a very I functional kitchen with 110 service with plug-ins into the walls mm -hmm. where you probably couldn't 15 years ago but we really have no way to enforce that at this point is that some no stove yeah. And, and we will be looking at that as we move through the comp plan process. Curtis, did you want to? Uh, have yeah, uh, briefly, Madam Mayor. I mean, I'm right across the chamber here from Commissioner Hamby, and I, I realize he could he could live without that kitchen the, the way that I've known him all these years. I don't know if my stove works. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a good, good that? point. Um, so, so you know, I'm c considering that, uh, I, I I do think that. 15 foot high structure, you know, which is again midpoint, which could mean a, a 20 foot high ridge line, um, could be pretty prominent if, if that was three feet from a neighboring property line. And, uh, and I'm inclined to support using the existing zoning district's side and rear yard setbacks as our, as our guidelines. I just uh, kind of feel the same as some of my colleagues. And just to make sure, and I think you guys are clear, but I just want to make sure we are all on the same page, that, that we're not proposing to reduce that setback to allow them to go to three feet as part of action taken. That's the language that's been in the ordinance yeah. mm -hmm. since 2000. Absolutely, right. you have the opportunity to change it if you're not comfortable with it, but, but that is not a proposed amendment at this point. Right, and, and thanks for clarifying that, Brad, and, and, and that is a good point. But just given the amount of infill, and, and, and actually given the fact that you know, I, I think these accessory structures make a lot of sense, and we're probably going to be seeing more of them, you know, kitchen or no. Uh, having a reasonable setback is something that I think would be a benefit to neighbors. 
Allison, you can get back to you. Uh, yeah, and I want some feedback on, and this, I'm not sure who would answer it, is if we went down the road of making it the setbacks for the primary structure, mm -hmm. something in that terminology, would we have to date, like get into where as of this date so that the others are grandfathered in and we don't end up with uh, non-compliant? now from the ones that are already approved how, I mean, do, how does that work that's generally the way that, there's some language in the ordinance that deals with non-conforming structures but just in general terms you know, the effective date of an amendment if you were to change yeah. the setbacks as part of this amendment the effective date of that amendment from that point forward anything <clears throat> legally permitted would have to be permitted under the new code anything legally permitted prior to the date of your legislative action Right. would be considered legal non-conforming, could okay. remain in place, could be repaired, maintained, could not necessarily be expanded if right. the expansion was into the encroachment, but um, but right. it would not require any immediate action for many of those non-conforming uses. Okay, and then that would be relative to not when a certificate of completion is done, but if it's already permitted to be done. So things that are in process right now, Yes. It, it's as at that but, but the key point being that legally permitted already. Legally if, permitted. if we've got a structure out there that somebody put up that they did not obtain a permit for, but it's on the ground right now and yeah. the ordinance changes and it affects their ability to come in and get a permit because CPD yeah. noticed it, they're not legal non-conforming and they would have to right. move it. Legally non yeah, legally non yes. Thanks for explaining that. And, and I uh, will probably be having some more dialogue to have a commission defined option that is covering that for on this on this topic um well yeah i was just looking at this a little bit closer um so we're limiting the square footage but are we limiting uh, is there any subordination issue between the structure in the back and the one in the front you know we had that with hpc where you know the structure in the back wasn't subordinate enough to the one in the front is there any issue in this where you can have a house that's less than i mean you're going to have this accessory structure sticking up in the back because the house in front's a little bit lower or that language doesn't change the the definition of accessory structure in a different area of the zoning ordinance says that it has to be smaller than the principal structure does it give like a specific like an no, inch long just smaller, smaller than so <laughs> you know in the case of the 800 square foot accessory structure you know if your house was 802 but, you know, but that's size, not height. Yes. I'm asking. No, about there, is, there is no, no subordinate, height. different set of codes. Okay. I mean, the subordinate issue that you were dealing with on the appeal was through the HPC process and design guidelines for historic preservation. No, if, if your house was a, a low pitch ranch house, you could do a two story accessory structure provided it did not exceed the zoning district height. Wow. Just okay. couldn't be larger than in terms of square feet. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, guys, that concludes our meeting. We're going to have an executive session, so we'll ask our visitors to leave us. Mm -hmm.